Okay, we will go ahead and get started. So welcome to everyone to our Women's History Month capstone event. We're so glad to have you here today and um, that you could join us for this with our um, esteemed guest, our living legend, Melissa Muganzo. And just want to give you a little introduction to Women's History Month before we get started. My name is Anastasia Panagakos. I am a professor of anthropology here at CRC and co-chair along in history of Women's History Month. I'm sorry, of history. Diana Reed of History Department, co-chair of Women's History Month. Get all the words in the right order today. And uh, before we get started, um, we just have a couple of announcements and also would like to do our um, land acknowledgement. Uh, this year, our Women's History Month theme, which is a national theme, which goes along with um, lots of different events and things that are happening around the country, is celebrating women who tell our stories. And it recognizes women past and present who have been active in all forms of media and storytelling, including print, radio, TV, stage, screen, blogs, podcasts, and more. The timely theme honors women in every community who have devoted their lives and talents to producing art, pursuing truth, and reflecting the human condition decade after decade. From the earliest storytellers through pioneering journalists, our experiences have been captured by a wide variety of artists and teachers. They also include authors, songwriters, scholars, playwrights, performers, and grandmothers throughout time. Women have long been instrumental in passing on our heritage in word and in print to communicate the lessons of those who came before us. Women's stories and the larger human story expand our understanding and strengthen our connections with each other. Speaking of stories uh, and humans, we also like to honor our um, Miwok and Nisenan people in the area. So we acknowledge that the land currently occupied by Kasumnas River College as the traditional home of the Miwok and Nisenan people. These sovereign people have been caretakers of the area since time immemorial. The state of California is home to more than 110 federally recognized Indian tribes, representing the most diverse set of tribal nations anywhere in the United States. Despite centuries of genocide and occupation, the Miwok and Nisenan people continue as vibrant and resilient federally recognized tribes, bands, and rancherias. The waters of the Sacramento, American, and Kasumnas rivers have nourished Miwok and Nisenan tribal communities with cultural and dietary sustenance through time. Kasumnas of Kasumnas River derives from the Plains Miwok language, stemming from the words kasumu, meaning salmon, and umne, meaning the place of, it translates as the place of the salmon. Today, we celebrate our Miwok and Nisenan tribal neighbors as the ancestral stewards of this land and honor their sustained existence. It is with their blessing and continued guidance that Kasumnas River College seeks to provide an accessible, equitable, and principled institution of learning. And now I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Diana Reed from History, to introduce our speaker. Um, and actually, wait, right before I do that, um, this is being recorded, just so you know, and also if you could please silence your cell phones, that would be wonderful. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. Thank you all for coming. We are very excited, as Anastasia said, to welcome Melissa Munganzo to our uh, campus and our community. Melissa Munganzo, pronouns she, they, sis, is CEO of Munganzo Entertainment, executive producer of the summer film, The Big Histo, A Black Womb Revolution, and owner of Mindy's Kitchen. She is an actress, activist, and humanitarian who believes in the power of black ingenuity being the global catalyst to historically and presently advance global technology, engineering, entertainment, and inclusion. Melissa earned a bachelor's degree in community and regional development from UC Davis in 2011, a master's degree in higher education leadership in 2013, a professional certificate in entrepreneurship in 2018 from Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy, and is a graduate of California State Legislature Program, the Alchemist Micro Enterprise Academy. Melissa's life motto is, do it afraid first and then with confidence and she sees herself as a living legend in real time. Please join me in a nice warm welcome for our speaker and guest today, Melissa Mungonzo Murphy. Oh, 
Okay, well, since this year's theme is celebrating women who tell our stories, can you start by telling us your story? Mic check, mic check, one, two. What's up, everybody? What's going on? One, two, mic check, one, two, we back? All right. Do they both have to be on? Okay, here we, we'll share. Okay. Um, I first wanna give a shout out to one, all of the gaybies in the room. As a queer black woman, it's really important to shout out all my queer folks who are standing in excellence today, so welcome. And I also wanna shout out all my black students. What's going on, y'all? As a black student and a queer student who navigated higher ed where cultural spaces really helped me to graduate, I just wanna celebrate you and thank you for being here and all of your excellence, so yes. Now, about my very dramatic life. Okay, what is life without drama? Boring. So, I am the daughter of immigrant parents. My dad is from Nairobi, East Africa, Kenya, and my mom is from St. Thomas, uh, Virgin Islands. So I grew up understanding how powerful and how vast black identity was very, 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 very early. Multiple languages, multiple religions, multiple cultures. I just knew that black people can do anything very early. It wasn't until my parents got divorced, I was born in Florida and raised in Southern California, that I started to understand why people give what I would like to call negative outlooks on life because they are upset about the way in which life is going. How many of you have told a family member a dream of yours and they shut it down? Yeah? How many of you now understand that they shut it down because they themselves couldn't see what you saw? How many of you understand that they shut it down because they were disappointed with the way that their life was going but weren't brave enough to tell you that that was going on? Period. And so I knew really early that I was meant to be an entertainer. I used to sing and dance and act as a kid, so much so that when I got to high school, I was head cheerleader. Okay, what? Head cheerleader doing competitions. I had a dance company that traveled to multiple states. I had a singing group where I harmonized the harmonies and I wrote songs for them all before the age of 18. So of course, when it came time for me to go to college, I was like, oh, I'm going to Juilliard, I'm going to New York, I'm ready to pop off. And my very West Indian, very religious family was like, no, you're not. That is so cute of you that you would think you could do that. And I was like, dang it, your old family has some hating ass people. Ugh. So what I decided to do is my teacher senior year snuck me into AVID. Anybody in AVID? They were in AVID in high school? Yeah. I got snuck into AVID by a professor or a teacher in high school that was like, you want some free college waivers? I was like, gang life, of course, run it. So got it there, applied to four UCs and four state universities and applied to the farthest UC that I can find, which at that time was UC Davis. And as soon as I got in, I never took a college tour by the way. So I thought UC Davis was the bay. Bear with me, bear with me, I didn't know. Uh, I got, when I turned 18, throughout my senior year of high school, so I got my first credit card, it was $300 limit, I was bawling. I bought a round trip ticket, no, a one-way ticket to Sacramento Airport, had my then boyfriend drop me to the airport and broke up with him at the airport. And I was like, I'm out. I'm not taking my family with me or you. Because I understood that I needed new environments, I needed new space, and I needed the chance to fly. What I didn't realize is that I was flying into Davis. That's not the Bay. There's no black people. And I bought a one-way ticket. There's cows. There's nothing but cows. And so when I got there, I got into culture shock because I was like everything that I knew, right? Who's gonna do my hair? What food do you eat around here? What happens when I wanna go to a party? Ugh. Like I was pressed and so I chose to stay on the African-American residence hall floor because UC Davis has these things called cultural theme floors and residence halls because of the very low amount of students of color that attends UC Davis. They're knocking on about 40,000 students but at the time only 2.7 of the population was black so I felt very isolated. I think about 7% was Latinx, 12% was API but it was a predominantly white institution. Um, so you can imagine how isolating that is coming from a very black household. And so that's when I understood that it was time for me to stand in my excellence. And I actually got kicked out of school because I never went to class because I hated homework. It's gross. But I was studying something that wasn't what I loved. 
right? I knew I was supposed to be a dancer and entertainer, but my family told me that was a bad idea. And to study something smart, like international relations. Mm. So why would I go to class? Calculus, psychology, government. All I wanna do is dance and shake this you know what. So why would I do my homework with intention? I was and I was unhappy. And so I got kicked out, I had a 1.67 GPA. And I ended up going to Sacramento City College for a year to get my grades back in order and advocated for myself to get back into school. After I got back into school, I ended up turning 21. And then I got a DUI and went to jail. Still didn't tell my family. Because I was like, y'all didn't like me before. You're not going to like me now. So why would I text you about this? You're not going to help me. Got myself out of that. And that's when I understood there was a larger thing going on. One, I was screaming for support and screaming for identity, and I thought that I was supposed to find my hope and identity in other people. But everything that I knew I could become was right here all along. But I had given my power away, because when I heard no from other people, I thought that was a no period. Anybody ever done that before? If somebody told you no, I think that's a no period, yeah? Which is such a lie, right? Because you are your own yes, right? As long as you say yes, that's it. But it's a shame that we think that our family has power over us, or our friends have power over us, or even our community has power over us. We are our own genius in our own right. And so that's my foundation. And that started off the journey of who I am today. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I agree. I think we're going to have a lot of applause <laughs> after every question here. Um, OK, so tell us about some of the projects that you're working on right now. So I'm an actor. Anybody ever wanted to act? Like in commercials or in theater or in movies? Yeah, we should totally talk. I love talking about acting, it's so fun. Um, anybody ever want to write? Yeah, yeah, awesome. Has anybody ever wanted to design? Like design stages, clothes? Oh, so much money in that, it's sickening, so much money in that. Anybody like to do hair or makeup or lashes or nails? Yeah, there's a lot of money in that too. <laughs> so the industry is so big and so vast and I am so excited to be able to live out that dream despite my family saying that it wasn't a good idea. And guess what, once I started to live out on that dream, they started asking me for career advice. <laughs> the ghetto. So I was just so confused. But um, some of the things that I'm working on now is I'm in pre-production for my second film I'm also launching a vegan food line because I use veganism to heal my body from an ailment called fibroids, which is benign tumors that sit inside the uterine wall that can make menstrual cycles and intimacy and using the restroom very, 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 very painful. Um, I'm also a really big philanthropist and an activist. So today, the dress that I'm wearing is actually to raise funds for this event called Cancer is a Drag. And it's a drag show meant to raise funds for cancer patients that are trans. And so everything that I do is very, very intentional. And I'm, I'm a big believer that I could go tomorrow, right? I could, this life can end for me tomorrow. So I need to stand in my excellence and make sure that I show up for people because you just don't know. And I'm a product of somebody standing up for me when they didn't know me, when they knew that one day someone like me would need a place to thrive. And so that's just how I roll. That's how I roll with everything that I do. I know I gotta pull up for me and my family and I gotta pull up for the future because if I don't do it, I'm gonna wait for somebody else to do it, and they're not gonna do it like me. So I gotta go for it, every time, all gas, every single time. Thank you. So as um, Anastasia mentioned, our theme this year is celebrating women who tell our stories. What do you think is your responsibility or goal as a storyteller? My responsibility as a storyteller is to tell the truth even when it's nasty and sticky and dirty and makes people feel ashamed at first because when we tell the truth, we also allow room for growth, right? For example, I was raised religious. Anybody raised religious? Yeah? Anybody still practicing that re those religious values? Okay, yeah. Um, that tends to be a trend uh, because sometimes religion can be really limiting, right? They tell you have to fit into this box. Anybody raised really cultural, cultural household, cultural background? Anybody still practicing those cultural values today? Yeah. So as a child, I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. Have you heard of that before? Seventh-day Adventist? 
yeah, it was very limiting. Like, women don't wear pants. Women don't get their ears pierced. You don't have tattoos. You don't wear makeup. You don't speak. You don't preach. You just sing. That is your job, to sing and be an usher at church. That's it. And so when someone like me is like, oh, my gosh, I want to dance and I want to talk, they're like, no. And I was like, what do you mean, no? Like, what, <laughs> what does that mean, right? And I didn't realize that I was really, really trapped in this idea that I couldn't choose my own life. And that doesn't make me a bad person. It doesn't make me a non-believer in good or source or the divine or God or Allah, what, you know, whatever that is for you. Um, and me switching up, right, or flipping the switch does not mean that I'm anti-religion or anti-culture. It just means that I believe that I was born excellent. How many of you know you were born excellent already? Right, regardless of how you identify, regardless of your religious foundation, regardless of your cultural identity, you were born excellent. And we have this saying in the Christian church that says, God doesn't make mistakes. They don't, but we do, right? And I think about that from folks that identify as queer or trans, where people are like, that doesn't exist. Yes, it does, right? My identity is not based on your perceptions of what you think is and is not plausible, yeah? It's about everything that I know I am, everything that I know I am to become, everything that I know I am and have the capacity to be. And so once I understood that, I was very, 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 very proud to walk in my truth. And your truth is already inside of you. I was talking to Desiree the Great over here and we were talking about this idea of the quantum realm. Have you heard of the quantum realm before? The idea that the future already exists, have you heard that? Any of you have a dream where you see yourself doing things and you can't unsee that dream? Anybody in here had that? Or you can't stop thinking about an idea? In my mind, that's the future talking to you. Letting you know that it's already lit over here. And it's your job to get there, right? It's your job just to get there. Basically, your future self has their hand out to you and is saying, I can't wait for you to get here. You know that text, I'm five minutes away, but you're really not? That's your future, they're like, are you coming and you're sending that text like I'm five minutes away but you're actually about to get in the shower? It's your job to, be, to meet up with your future self that is looking you dead in the eye, dead in the heart, saying I can't wait for you to get here. It's so fun over here. Look at everything we've accomplished. And that is your job and that is how I live my life and that is how I see this life. That everything I want and everything that you want already exists. All the powerful things that you know you're meant to do already exist or else you would not be dreaming it, right? And that's something only you can see. Your family cannot confirm that for you, your friends, your colleagues, your professors, only you know it. And if you can see it, that means it already exists and you can attain it. Thank you. All right, how about um, tell us what you find most energizing about your career and what you're most proud of? So before I was an actor, I was an educator. I actually used to work at Sac State and at UC Davis and I was an admissions counselor and then I worked in housing. Mic check, okay. And then I was a career counselor, and then I ran the Pride Center, I ran a cultural space. So I had a really holistic view on the student experience, especially as a student that got kicked out for bad grades, and then was able to thrive once I realized that my blackness and my queerness were a place of pride and not a place of shame. And so I went on to do that professionally and work as an educator and welcome other students with open arms for all that they had especially with someone that's the daughter of immigrant parents, right? There's just a different experience you have when your family feels like you are the golden ticket. Anybody ever felt like that? Like you are responsible for changing our family's entire trajectory. And you're like, I just got a D plus on this exam. It's not looking good, right? Uh, so one of the things that I would find exciting is I actually would call out sick to work to go audition all the time. I would see a casting call, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sick. <laughs> and I would go, or I would choreograph. I was a community dance teacher for a really long time, so much so that I, can, I basically convinced all my coworkers and I choreographed a Coachella tribute to Beyonce for all the black faculty and staff at Sac State, and it was 60 of us, and we hit it. I be getting to the money. I don't play when it comes to performance. And so I went from their coworker to their dance instructor. They were sweating. 
So stuff like that gives me energy where I get to tap into the gifts that I already knew that I have. And that's actually what gave me the courage to leave education and pursue entertainment full time and start my business because I understood that there's a difference between getting a job because you need financial support and getting a job and doing a job that makes your soul light on fire, right? Anybody just have a job because you're like, I really need this money. Anybody ever felt like that? Mm-hmm. How many of you are in the situation right now where you're like, I'm just here because I need to get paid? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a real thing because we live in a capitalistic society. You need money to survive. But at the same time, anything that you can't stop dreaming means now we need to look at this place of employment as a way to stack my bread so I can go do what I'm supposed to do, right? It's a shift of mindset. And stuff like that makes me happy. I also love kicking it with my friends. I love kicking it with my friends. They are my version of church. I know my poor staff. Uh, she can see my calendar, and I have this thing on my calendar called Ratchet Good Time. And she knows that's me with my friends. And she just shouldn't text me because nothing good is happening during that time. But I, ha okay, once a month, I have ratchet good time with my friends. It's important, it builds my self-esteem back up, it recenters me. I'm also a really big fan of comedy shows. I love comedy shows. I can laugh till my heart is like bursting at the seams and I'm just like, what a great day. So that's really where I find my joy when things are really, really tough or I just need to find center. Okay, thank you. Um, and just so everyone knows, we do. I have a list of questions, and then we will definitely open it up. So if you have some questions brewing, uh, jot them down so that we can uh, get to those. All right. Um, how about some of the best or worst advice you've ever received? Oh, okay. Yes. So we actually were just talking about this. The word advice, oh, so funny. The worst advice I ever got was the idea that I should get advice. How, is, how am I going to tell you how to live your life? Really think about that. How is somebody else going to tell you how to strategize about your life? When you say it out loud, you're like, I don't even know why I asked for advice. Because I don't walk in your shoes, so I don't know what you're battling every day. I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what you're worried about. I don't know what real life concerns you have. I don't know what you've overcome. So how am I gonna give you advice? Gross, but people really feel that they can. And then they will judge you whether or not you take that advice or not. But they are not you. Oh. So that is actually the worst advice that I got is that I should ask for advice. No, you need to learn how to trust yourself because you are your own expert, right? You got yourself here today. You are turning in your own homework. You know what you're up against. How is somebody else gonna tell you the best way to live out your life? Absolutely not. Family, friends, everyone included. So that's some of the worst. Some of the best advice I got was fix your self-esteem, fix your career. Fix your algorithms, fix your career. Best advice. We are what we believe about ourselves. If you do not think highly of yourself, guess what's going to happen? It's going to show up in how you introduce yourself, the things you're going to go after, the jobs you're going to try to find, the friends you're going to keep around you. It's all going to be indicative of whether or not you believe in yourself or not. Right? You can't dream if you don't think highly of yourself. You're gonna cap yourself. Fix your self-esteem, fix your career. Fix your algorithms, fix your career. You are in full control of your algorithms. You don't like something, get it off your profile. If you want something to come to you, add it to your profile. The algorithm gods are very powerful, right? So that's some of the best I've gotten. Thank you. All right, um, how about what kind of skills do you think are important for people who want to succeed as entrepreneurs and in the entertainment industry? Oh yeah. Uh, let's do a test, how about that? Is that cool? How many of you want to be an entrepreneur? Kiyu, hey colleagues, love that. Okay, let's, let's practice on birthing it. How many of you already know what you want to call it? You do? What is it, what's the name? 
Constant Create, so cute. Is it LLC? Okay, let's just say Constant Create LLC, right? So you are the CEO of Constant Create LLC, yes? Yes, do you have a profile that says that? Love that, very, very beautiful. Okay, so with that, do you, how often do you tell people about it? Beautiful. I want to, first of all, thank you for being vulnerable. Everybody clap it up. This is very, very vulnerable. And then I got you. Everybody follow them on TikTok. Uh, right, I got you. So with that, right, in order to be who you know you're meant to be, you have to introduce yourself as that. You cannot be discovered or make money if you don't tell anybody that you do these things. I used to have a podcast called The Hired, which was a pun on higher education and also being hired. And we would bring on these people and all these different um, entities that would say they're looking for students to hire. And so my job was to always bring the diversity lens. Like you say you want diversity, but then when people get there, you tell them to dress a very certain way. Why did you hire them? Because job interviews are scary, right? A lot of anxiety, what am I gonna wear? What am I gonna say? How am I gonna fix my hair? Hope I don't fumble the bag. Is there an edit on my, uh, my resume? It's stressful. Just to get through it, you're like already sweating. You need to go like take a shower. It's stressful. I remember I was talking to one student who said that they wanted to go to grad school for econ. Work with me here. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, you know, it's very rare that someone wants to get a master's degree in economics. So like walk me through that. I already knew I was about to light this soul on fire, but it's all right, we're working through it, it's a process. He goes, yeah, I'm gonna be the first in my family to get a master's. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Why? Well, I'm gonna be the first in my family. I said, no, no, I got that, but like, why is that important? He was like, well, it's not important to me. I was like, but you're doing the homework. And he was like, no, it's for my grandma. I was like, no shade, but grandma's on her way out. Right? If grandma wants the masters, we need to help grandma get into school. Why are you going to get a master's in econ? Well, my family, so is this degree for your family or for you? Because it's your homework and then your career. If you're miserable now just thinking about applying, imagine what your career is gonna be like. Because now we're just competing for student loan debt. And then you see the wheels start to spin, right? Because you haven't even graduated undergrad yet, but you're already miserable about the idea of going to graduate school. Forgetting that you have full power over this decision. Then the real juice comes out. I said, so what do you like to do? He was like, oh. I make beats. I was like, oh, so you're a music producer. He was like, well, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I said, has anybody bought your beats? He was like, yo, yeah, um, E-40 bought my beat when I was 16, and, and uh, Mac Dre, uh, Ma uh, not Mac Dre, um, Too Short bought my beat when I was 17, when I was in high school, and I had all these songs on the radio, and I was like, and you're getting a master's in econ. Why? My family told me I would never be successful as a music producer. I said, but you already are successful. And how are you, because his job is he really wants to make a beat for Drake. How was Drake gonna find you in the econ program? Why did you introduce yourself as my name is such and such and I'm a music producer? Well, I'm not famous yet. Well, you're not gonna get famous if you're going to apply to get a master's in econ. So it was, it was this conversation about realizing that sometimes we're doing things totally for other people, but we've been programmed to think that it's for us. It's not. And you're about to set yourself up for a life of misery because you haven't stopped to remember how much power you have. And if you do not claim your talent right now, whether you have followers or not, whether you have believers or not, you're not gonna get to that entrepreneurial level because people don't know you as that. So if any of you want to be an actor, that means you're already an actor. You know this. If you want to be a fashion designer, you're already a fashion designer because you already see yourself doing that. 
If you want to be a celebrity nail tech, you're already that. And you have to start introducing yourself as that because that's how all the manifestation comes to you, right? Because again, the future is already there. We talked about this. Does that make sense? So you are already a CEO, period, right? It already exists. There's already a room full of actors, a room full of entertainers, and a room full of business owners. You already exist. Now it's time to own it, yeah? Yeah? Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, so this question, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your film, The Big Histo, A Black Womb Revolution, and what uh, reproductive justice means to you. So reproductive justice is really important because every single one of us come from a womb that sacrificed its comfort for us to be here, yes? We are living examples of somebody saying yes to our life. You understand this, regardless of gender, right? Somebody pushed us out or cut us out. You understand this, right? Do you understand this? That means that regardless of how you identify, regardless of what your religious belief system is, somebody's womb said yes to you and decided to carry you for a certain amount of months, right? So when I think about reproductive justice, I think about it from that lens. Somebody said yes to me when they didn't have to. Whether I'm close to them or not, whether I love them or not, somebody said yes to me. Whether they did right by me or not, whether they were able to finance my life or not, somebody said yes to me. That also means that I also am gonna know somebody with a womb. I'm gonna have a neighbor with a womb, a classmate with a womb, a professor with a womb, a colleague with a womb, a family member, whether I have a womb or not. That means half of the world at any given time is menstruating or producing life. So when I think about reproductive justice, I think about it from that lens. It's not just about like, oh my gosh, you're having a baby. No. I'm talking about the world does not move without a healthy womb. Do we understand that? There is no future if the womb is not protected and taken care of. And when I think about justice, I think about a lot of the experimentation that's done on wombs specifically our grandmothers, right? Technology only exists based on trial and error. Has anyone ever stopped to think about how much trust we have when we go to the hospital and people are like, oh, we're gonna have to have surgery and we're just like, okay. But that surgery was perfected, which means there were some times where it worked and some times where it didn't. And depending on who you are and how old you are and how you identify, sometimes you were given consent and sometimes you weren't. My film specifically focuses on the experimentation done to enslaved Africans during the 17 and 1800s that actually created the entire medical system that we have today. J. Marion Sims is the father of gynecology. That should make you raise an eyebrow. Because how you do that? He also created the vaginal speculum that's used for pap smears. How you do that? Slaves didn't have, con didn't have value or consent paperwork. How you figure it out? Oh, trial and error? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so early 1800s, did they have Tylenol? How you figure it out? Oh, you just went in? Do you imagine how painful that is? Some babies survived, some didn't. Some people were raped to figure out the size of the speculum. Over and over again. And guess what? He wrote his own autobiography, 471 pages that documents this harm. He's also the founder of the first women's hospital. Weird, right? 1855 in New York. It was actually his slave quarters in his backyard. So when we think about the fear that people have when they go to the hospital, especially if you're not English speaking, especially if you don't have strong insurance, especially if your doctor is someone that does not look like you, people are scared and they have every right to be. And so the film talks about that and how racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia impacts the hospital experience for everyone and how medical physicians, whether you plan to go in the medical field, whether you are in the medical field, whether you teach in the medical field, 
need to be honest about people's real life fears, navigating, just trying to get wellness, trying to care, trying to maintain. And that's what we talk about. And so I'm on tour currently. We actually leave for San Diego tomorrow morning to go to our next tour stop. Um, there have been 10 tour stops. We have three more. And there's been over 25 tour stops for conversations much like this. So, and this is also a film that everybody tell me wasn't a good idea. Oh, well you, oh, well thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I remember telling people I want to make a film and they were like, oh, well you're not a filmmaker. I was like, I know, are you gonna help me? And they were like, well no, because you're not a filmmaker. I was like, oh. And then those same people say, oh my gosh, can we interview you? Great job. Sorry, I'm unavailable. Oh, schedule's packed for ratchet good time. Sorry. <laughs> right? So, yeah, you, that's why you have to just trust yourself. Trust your gut. Trust yourself. Own your excellence. Nobody else can tell you how to be great. Only you know. Well, congratulations on the success you've had with that film. It's an important story Thank for you. sure. All right. Um, so being that we are a community college here at CRC, tell us what community means to you. Yeah. Uh. Well, first you have to have community within yourself, right? You can be lonely, but you can never be alone because you have yourself. And I used to think that if I have people around me that I was alone, that's not true. I am someone that suffered through depression and anxiety, low self-esteem, insecurity. I had really bad acne. I was a musty kid. Like I was like really strong target for bullying. Like let's just be honest. And performing arts really saved my life because that's where I found home. I was able to express and perform and get dressed up and cause a scene and bring all this drama to the stage. I loved it. Uh, but outside of that, I was the really insecure kid. Uh, my dad left our family when I was eight and stopped talking to me in 2016 when he found out I was gay. And so I was really dealing with abandonment. And so I used to rely on my friends and my family thinking if I was around them, then that's when I had community. But then when they couldn't show up for me, I was like, you're not my community. Not realizing that I am my community, right? I am everything that I need. I can have people around me that love and care about me and I love and care about them but I have to trust that I am good all by myself, that I am 100% whole by myself, and that anybody that I engage with is just the icing on the cake, right? And that really reminded me why therapy is important. So I've been in therapy twice a month, every month for the past four years. I believe in that. And when my therapist has to cancel, I'll be like, girl, like who else could you possibly be talking to? Like it is on the calendar. Selfish, I know, I'm toxic, I'm working through it. Uh, so that's what I feel like community is. It's really in yourself, understanding that once you have yourself and you love yourself fully, I'm talking about stank breath, eye boogers in the morning, love yourself. I'm talking about musty armpits, and you're, so you're keeping your arms down because you don't want to bother nobody, love yourself, right? That is what I'm talking about. Like once you love yourself and you know there's nothing that can disrupt the excellence that you have because you're already perfect, and there's nothing more you could accrue to make you even more perfect because your art, your essence is excellent, then community will be inside of you and all around you, right? Because you'll be unshakable. And that's what community is to me. It's a strong sense of self and an unbreakable behavior to where you understand that no matter who you engage with, whether somebody says yes or no to you, you are all that you need because you are just that powerful. Each of us have the power to manifest. That's some magical shit. That means you're already powerful and that community is within. So don't forget that. Thank you. All right, a couple more questions here. So um, you are here as our guest for our Women's History Month celebration. So in the spirit of Women's History Month, can you share with us which women inspire you? Oh my gosh, yes. First of all, um, Tiana Taylor, let me tell you something. Those abs, one day. I believe in eating all the time, so I don't know if I'll ever get there, but it's inspo. We said inspiration, right? Okay. Yeah, Tiana Taylor. I love how she navigates through masculine and feminine energy and masculine and feminine presentation. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. Short hair, long hair. She's great. Um, Viola Davis is a strong actor. 
She gives range. I can't wait to give range. Even that quiver lip. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I love it. Um, other really strong women. Uh, I'm a Beyonce stan. You should know this. Yes, I have tickets to the concert. I'm ready to go and live my whole life. And I only wanted to go with people that were ready to risk it all. Like, that's the energy I'm bringing. I'm doing full choreo. I'm singing loud, losing my voice. Like, if you're coming calm, like, we probably shouldn't sit together because I'm. you're going to be sick of me. You should just know that. Um, and the reason I love Beyonce, not just because of, you know, her beauty and her style, because those things are, like, put together, right? Like, she has an excellent hairstylist, let's be honest. Wigs are always on point. But it really is that she has understood how to monetize her essence. Does that make sense? It's not about what she sells. People are going to buy it because they love Beyonce's essence. And she has proven that she has a good core and has learned how to monetize her core values. That, to me, is very strategic. And that is the type of person I strive to be, that I have figured out who I am, what I stand for, how I show up, and I'm very selective in what I decide to promote and what I think is good for the community. And I've learned to monetize that for the sake of doing macro human rights work. And I feel like Beyonce and her team have figured that out. And that's why I'm so inspired by her. Angela Bassett, queen. She looks fantastic. Fantastic. So folks like that, I'm really, really inspired by. I'm also inspired by all of the troublemakers. Love that. Nobody ever made it in the history books without causing trouble. You should know that. Like, very boring. Cause a little trouble. It's good. I'm here for that. I'm also here for all of our, our trans women and our queer folks that didn't make it in the history books that caused the scene, caused a rumble. Our Marsha P. Johnsons, right? Our Ebony Harpers in the community. Our people that are doing the work. Our La Roach, who is a non-binary fashion, de uh, non fashion designer. All of our folks that didn't even get to make it in those books that are really the foundation of everything that we see and do. All of our ballroom queens, yeah, those are my people. Yeah. Thank you. All right, um, how do you think the trajectory of your life or career might have been different if you identified as a man? Oh, first of all, uh, I'm stressed out just thinking about it, okay. I'm like, oh my gosh, what deodorant would I have? Like, I was really thinking, I was going in, I was going in. Fun fact, I did drag last year, and I was this guy named Peter Piper, and I, mm-hmm, it was so fun. It was very hot. I was like, everything is so hot. My pants are hot, my shirt is hot. Oh, it's so hot. Anyway, I had facial hair as a whole thing. I'll show you pictures later. Well, Peter Piper's coming back up, because in May, I'm a board member for the gay chamber here in Sacramento called the Rainbow Chamber, and every May, we fundraise, and we do this thing called Babe Day of Giving and the board members dress up in drag. And so Peter's making a comeback. Uh, my friends told me that Peter was whack and they would never give Peter his num my number. And I was like, dang, that is so messed up. So they're gonna help me do a makeover for Peter so Peter can have a little game and I don't know, get a number, we'll figure it out. So I think as a man, I probably wouldn't have been told that acting wasn't a good idea. As a man, I wouldn't have been told to make sure I'm independent. If I was a man, I wouldn't have been told uh, to not have sex. If I was a man, I wouldn't have been told that, uh, for me, college was necessary. I could have done sports or athlete athleticism. Um, if I was a man, my, me cutting off my hair wouldn't have been a big thing for my family. Um, if I was a man, I wouldn't have been told, uh, don't wear that, don't eat that, don't do that. It's not ladylike. Um, if I was a man, I probably would have had way more speaking opportunities at school and at church. Um, if I was a man, me saying I was a business owner wouldn't be a big to-do. And that's how different my career would have been. If I was a man, my father would still be talking to me. If I was a man. But I'm not, and he missed out, but. I'm sure he will be talking to me. <laughs> um, and I think for people that are um, women identified, get it. Do you get me? Like, do you hear what I'm saying? It, it's like a, like a non-negotiable. Um, there is this pressure. To, I remember when I told my mom I wasn't having kids, like I wasn't entertained by the idea of having children. 
And she was like, you don't want a little face like yours? I was like, God, you have to feed it and love it and cook for it. And it's going to call you and you have to teach it how to do things. And then like at 18, it may still want money from you. Like I'm, and how's it supposed to come out? Like there's not a third option. Like I don't, and she was like, Melissa. And I was like, what? I'm being honest. You want me to be a bad parent? Like I don't, I don't know what to tell you. And she was like, oh, that will change. And like it didn't. And so now the pressure's on my sister, so good luck. But, you know, stuff like that. I feel like there's not that same pressure for male-identified folks to produce. There's, like, this sense of pride and joy and prize, especially between mothers and their sons. It's almost like they can do no wrong. Um, but for women-identified folks, for queer folks, for trans folks, it's like, oh, if you just did the following things, you'd just be better. You could get more love, more attention, more affection from me, if you could just do this. Does anybody else feel me on that? Does that come? Which is why you have to trust yourself, right? You have to trust yourself and know that regardless of how people approach you or tell you what they think your limit is, you know exactly who you are and what your capacity is. And then they'll call you for career advice. <laughs> Thank you. That was really powerful. I'm just kind of playing through my mind of all the messaging I've had, too, just hearing you kind of list it off like that. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, well, I have one last question before we turn it over to you guys out there. And my last question is, what does it mean to you to be a living legend? Ooh, this is my favorite. So people have this, so as an educator, um, about eight years in my career, I created a scholarship for college seniors because there's a lot of love for high school seniors. Oh, I mean, it's giving full drama, red carpet, dramatics, good food. But college seniors, let me tell you, like they almost forgot you were once a freshman. It is ridiculous. And it's really when you're the most scared. And so I decided to make this thing called a college transition scholarship. So if you wanted to go to law school and couldn't afford the application or the exam, I paid for it. You need to take the LSAT, I'll pay for it. You're trying to tell me you're an LSAT away from being a lawyer? What? Here's this 265. That's how I saw it, it's an easy fix. Oh, you wanna go to med school but you can't afford the plane ticket to go to the interview? I'll pay for it. It's a you're a plane ticket away from being a doctor? Your family is a hater, here's a check. That's how I literally thought about it. Wait, you want to start a business and your family won't give you $800 to get your LLC? Just, you're $800 away from being a well-known business owner? That's it? Here's a check. That, that to me was a really easy fix. I can't run your career for you, but the fact that something that's less than $1,000 is stopping you from being great and we're all just sitting around here letting that happen, like I was like throwing up. I was like, this is terrible. So I created a scholarship. And you know what they said? You're too young to create a scholarship. I was like, why? It's my money. Just give it to the student. And I was 27. And they were like, wow, usually people are like 80 plus on their way out are the people that are making scholarships. I was like, well, there's no fun in that. I'm not gonna live to see any of the good stuff. I might be on a respirator, who knows? Like, that's not fun. But for me, I understood that I believe that excellence existed already and that I can give people money right now if I wanted to. And so I did. And people would tell me, wow, you're incredible. I was like, I mean, thank you, but I also just saw a problem and I fixed it. Just like, y'all can fix this, right? You ever seen somebody need something and it's something that's like 50 bucks and you're like, I could, I could just give you the 50 bucks and then it could just be done, right? And so I started to realize that you could be any age and be a legend because that scholarship, that scholarship lives on and I no longer work in education, but it exists already. And every year we make seniors dreams come true. And that to me is legacy work. That means when I'm long and gone, it will still do its thing. Same thing with my pipeline to entertainment for college students. You shouldn't have to be a theater major to know that you can make it in Hollywood. You can be any major. You can transfer to a four year, you cannot. You still just be, should know that you should be able to go. 
And why can't I help you do that? That's easy. You're telling me you're an email referral away from being an actor, and I can just like, fi I can fix that? Are you serious? This is how simplistic it sometimes is, right? You mean I'm a question away from answering the, 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 the answer you need to go off and be great? That's it? And sometimes that's literally it. So that's when I knew like, oh, I'm a living legend. We like to give people that have passed on and call them legends, but you didn't call them a legend when they were here. You called them troublemakers. You called them noisemakers. You called them tyrants. You called them people that were imperfect. But then you want to celebrate them at the funeral. Uh-uh. Give me my flowers right now. I'm doing legacy work right now. I'm doing intentional work right now. I'm doing game-changing work right now. Because all of us think that we're going to get the opportunity to age. We don't know that. We do not know that. We don't know if we'll get the opportunity to retire. We don't know that. Go after yours right now. Go get it. It already exists. You got it. And that's why I call myself a living legend. Yeah. Thank you. OK, well, thank you so much. And I would love to hear from some of you guys out there. I think we are down to one microphone. So I will come <laughs> bring it to you if you have a question. Um, anybody out there have a question for Marissa? OK, yes, let me know. Or if you want to come. Yeah, so I actually admire your personality and your confidence. Yeah. So I got a question. What inspired your interest in performance? So, how did you undo um, stage fright and everything? Ooh. Yeah. So, for me, when I would sing, I would close my eyes because I wanted people to feel my soul. But then, once I understood that I loved locking in with people, I loved locking in. I loved, yeah, I love energy shift. I love locking in. I love seeing people's soul. I love you to feel my soul. That to me is where I get energy. I love feeling your heartbeat. I love that. And that's when I was like, this is not stage fright. This is communication. I'm communicating with you through performance. And once I did that, I was like, oh, it's over. And I locked in. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. And what's up? Did you have any other questions? Um, actually do enjoy like this whole, this like whole speech because it was really nice. But my question is like the part when you said about him being an economist and like going for his graduate degree, like I'm all for like, you know, follow your dreams and goals and ambitions. But like at the same time, it's not like making us like being less self-aware and more of being delusional. Like sometimes, because like an example, let's say I, I want to be an actress, right? But knowing fully well, like the industry is full of a lot of nipple babies. And like, there are also like a few people that went from grass to green, but like a lot of it is mostly nipple babies. So like telling me who like, let's say I come from like a low background, you know, my both parents are immigrants. So I come from that low background. I have to like, you know, tell myself that let me not go and chase engineering. Let me just go and become an actress, knowing fully well, I don't have the funding and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not kind of making me feel like, being delusional in a way. How? The first thing is, I personally believe in nepotism because I hire people that I like. I think what we have been shown is that nepotism is only for white people. That's not true. Nepotism, nepotism is only for the rich. That's not true. How many times have you only done something because they're your friend? And you trusted somebody only because they're your friend? And sometimes it's a bad idea, but you're like, that's my friend. I'm going to do it. <laughs> that's all that nepotism is, right? But the people that we see have a lot of money. So we're told that this is a bad idea. For me, as an African and as a black person, I always see business black. I believe in that. I can do that as a business owner. I'm not saying no to anybody else. I'm saying yes to people that look like me and that have been held back. So it's not delusional that you want to be an actor and you carry this beautiful immigrant status. And it's really our job to recognize how the media will program us to think that with all these identities, that it's not attainable. That's not true. They're, the entertainment industry is global. We only see this much of what is available. Do you uh, have any streaming platforms, like a Hulu or a Netflix? Oh, I don't have to do that. Just shut down to me. No, but yeah, this is an example. Like, do you have like a Hulu or an Amazon Prime? Huh? Or even Spotify. You know that what you see is based on your algorithm, right? But the platform itself has a gajillion things on it. But you're only going to see what's ever alike by your algorithm. That's the same thing for media. We're only going to see whatever programming is given at the highest seller. But it doesn't <coughs> mean that representation that says that our identity in actress or in actor worlds or entertainment don't exist. It's all based on our algorithm and what we believe about ourselves. This is why everybody roots for the underdog, right? They're like, oh, you came from nothing and you're great. First of all, I didn't come from nothing. I came from excellence, <laughs> right? I didn't come from nothing. Oh, you're from low income. No, no, no. That's a societal pressure. My family may have had less money, but I wasn't low income. No, I've never been low. No one in here is low. I may not have enough money like you did, but low income, don't put that on me. Because I'm a millionaire in the making, right? So it's not delusional. It's all about do you believe you can attain it? If you can believe you can attain it, there is not a negative thing that can happen to you that will ever stop you from getting to what you're supposed to get to. Remember, fix your self-esteem, fix your career. Adjust your algorithm, adjust your career. And it's real. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Yes. Hi. Um. So my name is Marquise, and um. Oh, I can't. Okay. Um. First of all, I want to thank you for your greeting, because um, when you did uh, kind of reach out to the queer people in the room, it didn't make me feel seen. So I do thank you for that. And um. Um. So my question for you is: Do you find any importance in um? making sure that people acknowledge your identity, not only as a black woman, but also as a person within the queer community. Yeah. I understand that I have cisgender passing privilege. And so it's very important for me to be honest, upfront, and confident about my attraction to the sex and gender, and to normalize the conversation of queer liberation in any form, so that when people see me, they understand that I carry these identities. Because I also understand that there's been a history of shame attached to these identities, right? You can't be proud and be gay. You can't be religious and be gay. You can't be a good person and be gay. You can't be a philanthropist and be queer. You can't have a family. Like there's all these like things that people place on queer identity and liberation that are just not true 
specifically anymore. And so it is my job every time I get the mic to address the privilege I have as someone that gets the opportunity to be the spotlight of this attention and to honor the people that are awaiting that same freedom and awaiting that liberation and do not have comfort at home to be themselves and do not have friends that accept them for all of who they are and are waiting to breathe deeply and are waiting to find people that get them and love them. And I want a model that you can be everything that you are and be successful. And so that for me is super important. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yes. I'd like to comment on what you said earlier about skipping work to go to um, auditions. <laughs> I did the same thing, but I <laughs> I just like to know how you found opportunities. Along the way, I would invite them to my shows. Like if I did a dance performance, I would invite them. And once they saw me on stage, they were like, girl, why are you an educator? You know, people will start to hint at like, something there. It will start to show up more. And so once people understood that I had this talent or this gift, they were forward things to me. Hey, have you heard about this? Hey, do you know about this? And then, you know, the algorithm gods, aka success, <laughs> they're watching, right? So then your phone starts to get, so you know, you know, you say Ikea, and all of a sudden you have Ikea commercial on your phone, and you're like, okay, Joe Biden, everybody relax. <laughs> so same thing, like I, stuff, people would DM me stuff, people would forward me stuff, people would email me stuff. People at work would be like, you want to MC this event? We saw you in the community and you were just, and we just feel like, and that's literally, and every time I have this thing that my staff, I'm sure I'm taking them to therapy for, but I always say every time I execute, I'm interviewing too. Because when people see me execute, they're also thinking about where they can place me next. And so what I did is every time I perform, it wasn't just about that one performance. It was about people were going to say, you know, there's this thing coming up. You should do this. And every time I would go dance, they were like, oh, they're every time. Because I understood that concept. Every time I execute, I'm also interviewing. So I got to show up at 100% every time. This is why record good times are important. Self-care. I need to go get that out so I can be here and be present so I can lock in with you. Right? I could personally be an email away from everything you want to do. But I got, I got to know. I got to come at 100%, right? Maybe you have a dying question, and I'm the person that can refer you to the person that can open this whole thing up, right? That is how the magic happens. But it only happens when you stand in everything you are, right? If you shy away from everything you want to be, then the universe can't make it happen. Because you haven't announced it, you haven't declared it yourself. So yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Oh, oh, here, thank you. Hi. Okay, so I kind of came a little bit late, so I'm not sure if you've already, like, mentioned anything about this or covered it already, but, like, how do you, like, is there anything that helps you navigate fear or anything like that? Toxic Guy on the Breakfast Club. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a radio show that, they're a nationally syndicated radio show, but it has a little bit of toxic history. A little bit of toxic. Anyway, he wrote these books, and he talks about fear. So fear isn't real. Anxiety is. Right? There's danger, but fear isn't real. Right? It, it, we think about fear because we think we don't, ha we don't have control of the situation. And we're so prone to think the negative first over the positive. That's where fear comes from, right? People may say false evidence appearing real. You ever heard that? Fear is that. Because it doesn't exist. Anxiety, the idea of not having control of the outcome, that's real. But fear doesn't exist. Danger does, right? Your life being in danger. And so when I think about the idea of like the fear of success, once you understand, oh, that's what it's I just don't know what success is going to look like for me, and that is bringing me anxiety because I don't know the pathway to get there, right? Once you open it up and actually give it the comfort it deserves, then you can take a deep breath like, well, shit, I also don't know what I'm going to eat today either, so am I afraid of that? No. 
Do I have control over that? Kind of. So I want to encourage you to call fear out and be like, wait, this actually isn't real. What is real is my anxiety about the situation because it's new. I've never navigated it. I'm the first in my family to do it, so no one can tell me the best way to go about it. Or I don't feel like I have full control of the situation, and that is making me uneasy because I'm used to being in control. Let me call that out. And then ask myself, well, what do I have control over? Showing up, saying yes, asking a question, figuring out, telling my friends and family or my people that support me what I need. I have control of that. Adjusting my algorithms, I have control of that. So fear doesn't exist. Anxiety and lack of control exist. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Okay, my hand up over here. Um, you were talking about how self-esteem like leads you into your career, but in the face of adversity, I find it hard. You know, I believe in myself, you know, 100%. But even saying that out loud right now, it's always like, well, there are those times where you don't. So, like, how do I condition myself to be my own supporter? Really, like, I feel like that could be hard because of the environment I'm in, or you know, the situation that I try I try to put myself in. But it's hard for me to be comfortable with the fact that that I'm uncomfortable a lot of the time. So when do you start developing that? Yeah, thank you for being honest about that. I think a lot of you in the room can relate to that. Uh, you got some snacks. You got some snacks out there. I heard it. <laughs> so uh, two things can be true. Are you scared of rejection? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. That's really where those feelings come from, right? Is the idea of putting energy out, and someone can say, despite all that energy, we still said no. And the feeling of disappointment once you hear no, once energy is put out, you know what I mean? You know that feeling? That's what causes you to like turn the lights off, put dramatic music on, eat some pizza, and like watch Netflix, right? <laughs> uh, but I want to empower you to remember that that type of rejection is just a moment. It's not your life. It's not lifelong. It's project specific and moment specific. Have you thought about it like that before? Yeah, sometimes we think no means no to everything. And if you're dramatic like me, I mean, I can get an EGOT sometimes, like big drama, like big <laughs> dramatic drama, like table flip and everything. Sometimes you think a no to a moment is a no to you, a no to a journey, a no to a career, a no to an outcome. It's not true. It's just project specific, specific, moment specific. And as you practice that thinking, you start to realize, oh, I can get seven no's, but one day I will get a yes. And that yes is gonna make all those other no's seem pointless because it's gonna change the game for me. And I have to condition myself to do stuff afraid, which is why my motto is do it afraid first and then with confidence. It's not, it's not scary the second time. It's only scary the first time because it's new territory. So I wanna empower you to remember that if you do it afraid, meaning like you're scared to send an email but you still afraid to submit, Maybe you're a singer, you're scared to put it on YouTube, but you still upload it. Maybe you're a writer and you submit to a writing contest and you still submit whether you get a yes or a no. Maybe you have a film idea that you're like, I'm gonna make this film and hope people are gonna like it and people can hate it, but I'm still gonna create it type thing. Maybe I'm an artist and give a fashion that I'm gonna create my own clothes. People can hate it, but I'm still gonna create it. That's what I mean by doing it afraid. Like, with the doubts in your mind that you've been conditioned to believe more than the positive outcome. But did you still complete it, right? Because if you can complete it once, you can complete it twice. If you can do it twice, you can do it 10 times. Practice builds confidence. But it's the idea of completing it, recognizing that if you get a no, it's just a moment and it's just a project. It's not a no to you. It's not a no to your destiny. It's not a no to what you're supposed to do in this world. It's just a moment. And we cannot give our power away thinking that when someone tells us no, that it's a no to everything that we are. Thank you. Other questions out there? Yep, yep, okay. Hi, so you mentioned depression before. I don't know, I forgot where you me mentioned it during uh, the interview. 
But uh, I was going to ask, when did you realize that, or if you did get help, when did you realize that you needed help? I had a breakdown at work. Um, at the time, my sister worked there, and we were going to go to have lunch. And I was like, I think I need to cry. And she was like, OK. So we cleared the fries center out. So you need to clear the fries center. We turned off all the lights, closed the door. And I screamed in my office. I had a very toxic boss. Anybody had a toxic boss before? Thank you. We are just about at time. Um, if there's anybody has one more question, we could probably get one more in. Okay, last question over here. When did you start like just knowing to like love yourself and didn't care what anybody else like thought and like not having to hide who you really are? Yeah. Um I remember I had this one aunt that was the black sheep of the family that once I got older, I realized she was the black sheep because she was just like over the bullshit of the family. And that's why she was the black sheep. Like she wasn't just coming to family obligations to be talked about and she didn't care. And so one thing she 
told me when I was um, 27, and she was like, Melissa, one day all this is going to fall to the ground. I was like, what is this? She was like, girl, everything is going to fall. Gravity is going to tear us up. It's going to make us short. Everything's just going to fall. So you better show this stuff before it falls. I was like, what life advice is this from my aunt? And then I started to think about how my mother can't show up for me all the time because a little bit of her is jealous. Jealous that I did the thing. My mother cannot show up for me all the time because she wasn't taught that being an emotionally sound human being is a place of strength. And once I understood that, because I put a lot of like foundation in my mom, but once I understood that she was once just a little black girl too trying to figure it out, and she doesn't have all the answers and never will, especially for me and the gift that I've been given, I started to look inward and say, okay, well, Melissa, what do you know to be true? And that's when I cut my hair, and I realized I could still be beautiful and feminine with a haircut like this. And then when I started to be honest about who I was attracted to and found community and support from people that were also that identity or that loved me regardless of who I was attracted to, I started to remind myself that I was a little bit person. And then when I started to land certain things and I thought everybody that told me it's a bad idea is now resharing my actor reel for my commercial. But you told me not to do this. And the comments, always knew you were a star. You did? <laughs> that's crazy. And that's when I realized again, like, I got this. They don't have to have it. I got this. And I'm going to mess up, and I'm going to stumble, and I'm going to make mistakes, and I'm going to do things, and the scammers may come and get me. Let's just be honest, because Instagram scammers are the worst. So it may happen, but I'm strong enough to get through that, right? I also switched up my mentors. I didn't realize that mentors fizzle out. They max out, right? Because people can only get you to where they are. And then you have to switch it up. You might need new mentors. You might need new friends. You might need new community. You might need a new sense of self. You might need to try some things. That's when I figured it out. And I got really, really selective. And that's what it matters. Well, thank you, yes. And thank you for uh, selecting CRC. And, uh, <laughs> and thank you for sharing your story with us. It's been such an honor to have you here. And thank you guys all very much for coming.